Lola, brand new three-part drama, concludes tomorrow at nine on BBC Two. Newsnight now on BBC Two with Evan Davis. The last few days of this strange election have been dominated by terror. But 50 long days ago, a very different campaign began. It is a choice between me and Jeremy Corbyn. Boom, 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 boom. How much will it cost? I'll give you the figure in a moment. You don't know it? Gonna shoot you right down. What's the naughtiest thing you ever did? You're logging into your iPad. <laughs> <laughs> me and my friends sort of used to run through the fields of wheat. Um, the farmers weren't too pleased about that. Whoa! Nothing has changed. Nothing has changed. She's done another U-turn, Jeremy. Apparently, yes. He will find himself alone and naked in the negotiating chamber. It's time for a change. That strong and stable leadership. I think it's a shame the Prime Minister hasn't taken part in the debate. And I don't think seven politicians just arguing amongst themselves is actually that interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Hello, the talking is over, weeks of it. The election is imminent, you get your say at last. And for our final pre-election campaign reflections, we are at the Octagon Theatre in Bolton this evening. This is the town where it all started. Theresa May came to this relatively marginal seat of Bolton Northeast to start her campaign and her re-election pitch. And boy, in doing so, she kicked off yet another remarkable political event in the series of turbulent national votes of recent years. This has been an unpredictable, rule-busting campaign, and one in which many voters appear to have reaffirmed a desire for change and have shown a willingness to embrace different kinds of thinking. Well, by coming here, Theresa May put northern English towns at the centre of the battle, showering attention on the voters who, it seemed, were fed up who had voted Brexit and had flirted in large numbers with UKIP. It seems an age ago, but Theresa May came here just after Easter. Back then, you'd have guessed that people want a bit of calm and that her favourite phrase would be a winner. At the time, in places like Bolton, it seemed Labour support could ebb away. But after a slow start, things began to change more in this campaign than anyone could have imagined. The Labour recovery began. The volatile voter phenomenon was back. After a dull first half, the fight became interesting. Perhaps most remarkable has been the apparent re-emergence of two-party politics. Those old beasts, the Tory and Labour parties, have each in their own way adapted to life in the era of populism and discontent. Theresa May, well, she wanted to kill UKIP and has yielded some ground to it. Jeremy Corbyn has populist elements in his programme. Neither party bears much resemblance to their 2015 incarnation. Both parties realise something is afoot and our clumsy old system has somehow managed to evolve. So how do the voters of Bolton see things now? Today, I visited Vernacare, a factory that makes disposable chamber pots for the NHS and export. I think it's unfair to, be, to finish university with you know, so much prosperity, things, things you want to do with your life, and then suddenly you've got this massive debt hanging over you. You're going to, trouble to get, have, have trouble to get on the property ladder. Have you been surprised that there's so much kind of pickup to the Corbyn message during this campaign? I'm very surprised, uh, particularly given the circumstances the country's in now and the things that are happening that Corbyn is doing so well. Is, is, is something afoot, do you think? Is yeah. there a... I think it's the same with Brexit. People voted for change, but I think you have to be careful. You can't just vote for change. You have to look at the policies that you have and how they're going to move forward. You can't just vote for change. Are you optimistic? Um, I'm probably more optimistic now that Corbyn is making a late race, only in the, the fact that somebody who's so unfancied can now be clothing in the polls, I think shakes up the political establishment. Shakes up the establishment. Yeah. People, people can no longer think, oh, I can just go with the policies. So I think even if Theresa May gets in, she's going to have to start thinking about how she structures her government to ensure that actually she captures some of that unrest that's been seen. OK, you might not be surprised that many young workers in manufacturing end up supporting Labour. You won't find the same from older members of the local golf club. However, the surprising thing at the Breetmet Club 
is that while they won't vote for Mr Corbyn, they think he has a point or two. I think we all admire the, the principles that Jeremy Corbyn is putting across. Wait, wait, wait. You admire the principles that Jeremy Corbyn's put exactly, across. Yes. You're all voting Tory, but you admire the principles because Some we're, of the we're principles. because we're senior people Some. and we look back on our look back on our life and look at what we had and how the community functioned. If you're from London, there are plenty of opportunities. If you're from the north anywhere in the north of England, not just the northwest, traditionally you would fall back on say manufacturing. There is no manufacturing. So to reintroduce manufacturing back into the country post-Brexit would be an excellent thing because it opens up the door for lots of opportunities. So you look at his, his principles, yeah, you can't argue with them. And do you, do you agree with that, Lorraine? Yeah, I do. Yeah, he's got basic labour principles, what used to be, but he's too far. I don't agree with how he's so passive and... You know, and we've got to stick up for ourselves in this world. You can't just let people ride roughshod over you. I think um, his views um, are the views of what everybody, irrespective of, of what your uh, political allegiance is, I think the views are what we all want. We all want them, but I don't think he can deliver them. It is a time when the country seems unusually divided, and yet there does still seem to be a widely shared desire for some changing of the economic rules. But it may be that the election contest is about who can best rise to the challenge. Well, two politicians from this area are with me at the Octagon Theatre here in Bolton. Both have been serving MPs. Yasmin Qureshi for Labour was Shadow Justice Secretary until the election was called, I suppose, and Nigel Evans for the Conservatives, uh, and who has been a Deputy Speaker for some years in the Commons too. Well, very good evening to you both. Thank you. Evening. Now then, is, do you find in this area people are desperate for change or do they want stability? Because your campaign was all about stability and yours is more about change. What is it they want, that sort of thirst for change? But let's start with you, Yasmin. Yes, there is. I mean, for far too long, right, people have feel that they're not getting anything out of society. So, for example, you know, owning a home is difficult. Young people are living with massive debts, not being able to get onto the property ladder. We've got all older people still worried about what's happening to them. And also, you know, parents or people with children who are t worried about classroom sizes, education. I sense that there is a need for change. Right. Nigel, the people voted for change in the Brexit referendum. You supported them in that. I certainly but the did same, too. But the same thirst for change may be saying we want more radical people than, 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 than Theresa May. It, it depends races. what the change is. And Brexit certainly was the change in the northwest of England. Uh, and what is the change here? Well, there's uh, 11 seats in the northwest that we're looking at with majorities of fewer than 5,000. Theresa May's been up here several times in the yeah. northeast and the northwest of England. Uh, and she's come up here not just for her health, but because there are target seats and here. Is, is, this gonna, is, is it going to change? I mean, is, is, is she going to take loads of seats? Uh, Nigel first and then you. All right, well, all I can tell you is I've visited seven seats during the general election campaign. It may be a snap election, but it's been a long campaign, hasn't it, Yasmin? <laughs> and we're all grateful that it's uh, the eve of poll. And I've heard the same thing time and time again, Evan, which is this. I voted Labour in the past. I've been Labour all my life, and I'm not voting Labour this time. And the one reason... Jeremy Corbyn. It's because they don't think that he is a, a proper leader of the Labour Party. Theresa May's goal was to redraw the map of politics in England. Is she going to, Yasmin? No, she's going to. I mean, she had a false premise why she started the election on the basis of oh, she needs uh, more people to help her uh, do Brexit. When the Labour Party's official opposition supported triggering for Article 50, it was just a ruse because she saw herself in opinion polls going ahead thinking, oh, I can walk this election. But she's not going to. I'll tell you why. Because when she came to Bolton, she came in a helicopter and went to a <laughs> private meeting. <laughs> that does not impress people in the North. And even now in this campaign, right, <laughs> true though isn't, it? isn't that true that well, yeah, yeah but for ease of travel you know why people what? do what they do well no i mean jeremy's been using buses he's been using trains i mean today for example he traveled from glasgow down to london well, okay, 500 mile but, journey but yes, and she was in a private jet but i mean yes, that's yes, how many people yeah, yeah, yes well, i hope it's a private jet made in the northwest of england but <laughs> yeah. I, I'll, I'll pose this one question to you if i think um, i thought evans no but i'm, 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 I'm just i'm just interested in this because I've looked at a number of Labour leaflets in the northwest of England uh, over the past six weeks. And if Jeremy was such an amazing leader, one that I have to say 
uh, your own MP colleagues have tried to get rid of. Why is it that so many Labour candidates haven't mentioned Jeremy on their leaflets? Okay, quick well, answer, in that might... case, right, why is it that Mrs May right, doesn't mention the word Conservative anyway, except there's a minor little thing, okay. right, and it's all about let, me, let me, let me strong put, and stable. You're, 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 you're bickering. I'm going to put one <laughs> that put, says a curse on both your houses. Uh, you will both agree that there are large parts of the north of England, parts of Bolton, sections of Bolton that have been neglected and left to, to, to be left to run down. Both your parties have failed the north of England to some extent, haven't they? And what you have seen through the Brexit vote, through other forms of protest vote, you've seen people say, we want to be listened to in parts of the country like this. And it's a protest against you both. Well, in the Labour Party, with the manifesto that we have produced, and I think nobody can say it's a fantastic manifesto. We talk about investment. We talk about banks that will I do asked investment. I your in record, though. Are you going to concede that you had made a mistake and had let things drift well, too much in parts of the country? Well, in the Labour Party, when it was in government, we had real expenditure. We invested in the country. We expected in our hospitals, in our education, in our schools. We created jobs. Okay. So I don't think that we left the North West no. behind. However, I think the so it's all fine. It was all no. fine until the Tories no. got in in 2010. No, no, it's not. Okay. I'm not saying that. I think there's a, a big change taking place. I think the current Labour Party manifesto taps into that and recognises the fact that there doesn't need to be a change. Uh, I'll, I'll concede that there are definitely pockets of deprivation throughout the whole of the northwest of England. And there are people there who feel as if nobody's been listening to them, that they are the just managing people and those who are hardly be, uh, managing at all. And they're the ones who I think are looking, they're the ones who voted Brexit, and they're the ones who are now looking to the opportunities that leaving the uh, European Union is going to give to areas like the northwest of England. And that's why I'm really pleased we're going to have one of these trade commissioners for the northwest who'll be going out there, winning contracts, creating jobs in the northwest. OK, you both managed to make just a little bit of your own pitch, your party <laughs> pitches at the end there. Thank you both very much Thanks. indeed. Well, I wonder if the last day of a campaign actually makes much difference. You'd think most minds have been made up, but there is also the small matter of exciting the voters enough to make them turn out tomorrow. So certainly the candidates behave as if the last day matters. Theresa May was in London, Norwich, Southampton and the West Midlands. Tim Farron was in Solihull, St Albans and Twickenham. And Jeremy Corbyn was leading multiple rallies across the country. Our political editor, Nick Watt, spent his last day of the campaign on the Jeremy Corbyn trail. And so we'll be changing quite a lot on employment. With the clock ticking down to that brief moment when voters take charge, Jeremy Corbyn is in his element. A ripple of Corbyn mania could be heard across the country today. Good morning, Glasgow! As the Labour leader visited Scotland, England, and here in Wales. As a train buff, Jeremy Corbyn naturally travelled by rail standard class. I don't have a private jet, I don't have a helicopter. We're, I think some people go around in private jets, I can't imagine who it is. On his train travels over the past month and a half, Jeremy Corbyn has experienced mixed fortunes. At the start, he occasionally struggled to enthuse voters, who sometimes had other matters on their minds, as Theresa May enjoyed sky-high ratings, and then the Tories had their mid-campaign wobble. The Tory party thought it was going to be a walk in the park. They just thought, we're in a lovely park today, we enjoy your walk. They just thought, a walk in the park, what have they got to offer? We've got something very important to offer here. And so the crowds have turned out with similar chants and I love JC posters across the country just like this rally on the North Wales coast at lunchtime today. So, another ecstatic reception for Jeremy Corbyn. Here in Colwyn Bay, he's at the halfway point of his tour across Great Britain. Most of the seats he's visiting are not held by Labour. The signal he's trying to send is that he's reaching across. We know he can attract these sorts of crowds. The big challenge is, can he translate them into votes in the ballot box? The tetchy Corbyn of old has mellowed as he laps up the attention. You seem very happy. You seem very happy. I'm always happy. Are you very confident? I'm always happy. Thank you very much. Friends say that Jeremy Corbyn has relaxed into this election campaign. They talk of how he's rekindled the spirit of the Labour leadership contests. 
if he wins this general election, which he would do comfortably if he won seats like this one here in Cluid West, it would be the most remarkable journey from a fringe figure in the Labour Party to number 10 in under two years. Even if he loses, though, this general election campaign will have transformed his fortunes in the Labour Party and make it much more difficult for his opponents to dislodge him. In fact, this campaign has fired up his loyal Praetorian Guard. I just think he's dead sincere. I've, I never was into politics because I never thought pol uh, politicians were like normal people until now. And Labour supporters who originally had doubts about him are now enthused. I actually backed Andy Burnham in the leadership election. However, for me, the, the idealism of Corbyn is not just idealism anymore. We can put these policies into practice and I've got every faith in him. At the end of a gruelling day hopping on and off trains, Jeremy Corbyn ended his campaign this evening close to his backyard in Islington North. Whatever the result tomorrow, he believes he has changed the face of British politics. Well, Nick is now at the site of the last Corbyn event, that rally in Islington in North London. And Nick, I'm, I suppose we should try and get the mood of both the camps. And let's start with Labour. What are they feeling this evening? Well, it's not every day that you hear poetry at a political campaign event, but Jeremy Corbyn brought the Labour election campaign to an end at the Union Chapel here in Islington by quoting Shelley, Ye are many, they are few. So now we know where he got his slogan from. And I sense that this campaign ends with the Labour leadership in contented mood after Jeremy Corbyn exceeded expectations during this campaign. But they can read the polls like everyone else and tonight's polls do point towards a clear uh, Conservative win uh, in this general election. So I sense a mood in the Labour camp that whatever the result, they believe that Jeremy Corbyn will have changed the face of British politics uh, in this campaign. Uh, his aides talk about how they've shifted the centre ground. You had that Labour manifesto with some very serious spending commitments. They said that went down very well, so Labour can now be much bolder, they're saying. Now, look. If Jeremy Corbyn pulls this off, he will have changed the face of British politics. If he doesn't, I think it's fair to say he may well have cemented his position within the Labour Party. OK, Nick, that's Labour. Well, what are the Conservatives feeling? They've looked at the polls as well, presumably. Yes, I sense a much calmer mood amongst Conservative ministers after a fretful few weeks. Look. They acknowledge that their campaign has not been a glorious success, but they do say that in recent weeks, the mood and the reception on the doorstep has been much better than recent polls would suggest. But there are nerves. They say their heads are saying all should be fine, but in their hearts they say, who saw Brexit? Who saw Donald Trump? And one minister said to me, look, Jeremy Corbyn has been the dominant figure in this campaign, which will help Labour in some aspects, but they, those ministers, believe ultimately that will benefit them. And look, this is what one nervous minister told me this evening. Whatever evidence piles up in our favour, it is still going to be a heart-stopping moment at 10pm tomorrow night when the exit poll comes out. Nick, thank you very much. Well, it has been quite a year for Theresa May. She seemed to exude a quiet authority in the aftermath of the referendum, in contrast to the bickering boys in her party who were scrapping it out for the top job. There was a lot of goodwill as she embarked on a mission to recast her party away from the posh to the ordinary, to rebuild Tory Britain in a post-Brexit environment. But while she deftly positioned the party in a place that looked like it might own 80% of the political spectrum, She's not proved as deft at communicating. The election has evidently exposed a certain brittleness in her public appearances. I suppose we'll find out which matters more, the strategy or the ability to inspire with her, her words. Well, we asked the Times writer Matthew Paris, an independent-minded Conservative supporter, to make a film offering his view of Theresa May and her politics. Theresa May will not be the first Conservative Prime Minister to have travelled from a comfortable childhood in leafy rural England to the sooty brick hell of Downing Street, nor the first Tory woman to do it. 
but the speed with which this has happened leaves an electorate still trying to colour in an almost blank picture of the character, the personality behind this leap. I've met her, I've dined with her, I've discussed politics with her, but I still don't feel I know who Theresa May really is or what she's about. In this film, we've set out to talk to people who've known her or worked with her at different times in her life in search of what lies behind the steely gaze of the Sphinx of Maidenhead. At Oxford, she didn't join the posh set. As a friend she still keeps up with, Pat Franklin explains. I think we were a little bit of a gang. One of my friends described it as a group she joined because we were all very normal and we didn't sort of stand out, act posh, act different. And she said, they were, you were people like me. Pat says the ultimate ambition had already dawned. She was very interested in politics even then. And she wanted to be an MP. And she seems not to remember it, but I'm sure she told us she wanted to be Prime Minister. Her systematic approach to getting things done seems to have started early. How about her, her husband? What was she? One for the boys? Well, she had a string of boyfriends, and if they... Well, they, they seem to be more on trial, I'd say, than <laughs> most things. And they'd come into dinner. She sometimes seemed to have them overlapping <laughs> because we'd get kicked under the table if we started talking about the wrong film. And if it's one she'd seen with another boyfriend, she didn't go and want to go and see it again when we were unfortunate enough to inspire the new boyfriend with it. Once Philip came on the scene, that was it, the others all disappeared. So it was very, very fast that that was the one. And, and he was very nice, but he seemed quite young. He stuck, and is still stuck, so. Those early dreams of breaking through as a woman in politics were never forgotten. Baroness Jenkin, who co-founded with Theresa May an organisation called Women to Win, a Conservative Party project to increase the number of female Tory MPs, told me she carries on helping, pitching in with energy, but a kind of emotional detachment too. One or two people have said that she has quite a kind and encouraging side. You, you saw that, did you? Yes, very much so. But at the same time, very professionally. I mean, she wouldn't get emotionally involved with them. Mm. But um, I was struck earlier this year when I was talking about her on, on something, and a woman came, wrote to me and said, I've still got the letter, a framed letter that she wrote me saying, don't give up, keep going. So I think she, she was very well aware that for a lot of women, it's, you know, the resilience that she has uh, needs to be encouraged in others. And I think that she was, you know, very much trying to give some of these women, not exactly backbone, but the kind of support they needed. Both colleagues and journalists seem to agree that she's generally content to let her work speak for itself. Well, my first impression of her was as a journalist, and I've always rather admired the fact that Theresa May never wanted to impress journalists. Mm. And actually a lot of journalists found it very difficult because they could never get a story out of her. And I came to believe that she's a very rare politician who doesn't need to be liked. And I think that's quite an advantage. Well, I'm, I'm by nature a bit of a gossip and a bit of a, uh, you know, I, I, I like a chat at the end of the day. And that wasn't really her style. I mean, she was, as I say, highly professional. And, uh, but there was no, OK, let's kick our shoes off and, you know, chew the fat afterwards. Is she personally, socially uneasy? Colleague, can you have a laugh with her? Is yeah, she... absolutely. She's uh, she's funnier than um, uh, that. No public image um, uh, uh, sort of uh, suggests. Yeah, she's she's a, she's very good company on a car journey. She's very good company um, uh, um, if you were to have a meal with her. Nick Clegg, as deputy prime minister when Theresa May was home secretary, was never personally close, but he worked closely with her. Unlike Sir Eric. He believes he spotted an early insecurity. My recollection is of someone who felt slightly overwhelmed by what she was being asked to do in the Home Office, where we announced all these highly controversial savings. There was something uh, 
sort of especially meticulous, but 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 um, slightly unsure as well about the way that that she had sort of poured over all of the the numbers in in number ten. How about her emerging political philosophy? Had Thatcher been an early influence? I don't think particularly. I don't know why not, though she was quite irritated when she got to be Prime Minister. Yes. <laughs> um, pip to the post. Pip to the post. I'm sure I remember that. Um, I think Margaret's quite hard, was always seen quite harsh towards the common people. And I don't think Theresa would like that. But if she wasn't exactly a Thatcherite, what was she? What was the wider vision on the economy? Foreign affairs. She was meticulous about the trees, but how about the wood? Nick Clegg thinks she took refuge in detail and found her reluctant to talk alone without special advisers. I asked her not to bring um, these special advisers with her into the meetings that I used to have with her because I just found it all rather disruptive. But I did find that, as a result, I could never get a decision out of her in the meetings because she'd have to go back and sort of, you know, I assume, uh, test her uh, you know, ideas and test my suggestions with people around her. The most striking thing of all is how little she said or so, how, how little she sort of displayed much interest in wider political issues. I don't think, I don't think I can recall a single instance, either in private meetings with her or in private conversations with her or around the cabinet table, where she ever said anything interesting about or of interest in our economy, which is an extraordinary thing. I think she has a major weakness, which is she's not very interested in business and she doesn't understand business terribly well, I suspect, and I think neither does her inner circle. I think this, as we head into Brexit, is going to be a major issue that she needs to get an awful lot more sophisticated about giving business confidence. I think in terms of sort of an organising vision for society, I'm not really persuaded there is much there. I offer myself as your Prime Minister. And if they're right and she lacks an organising vision, does she lack firm destinations too? I asked Camilla Cavendish about those recent U-turns, the manifesto promise on social policy, for instance. I imagine that what will have happened is, yes, she will have been pretty nervous about the reaction, that Linton Crosby will have told her to get the barnacles off the boat, which is you know, because it was becoming a distraction in the campaign and she was back down. Um, that suggests to me that she may not have been as committed to the policy in the first place as I had assumed, because to push a policy like that through, you do have to be pretty determined uh, to face down the opposition. Intelligence comes in so many forms and perhaps general phrases about intellect are meaningless. But I asked Dan Jenkin anyway. Does she have a good mind? I don't know. I, I mean, not, she's not obviously brilliant, but she has a good enough mind to have got to Oxford at a time when it wasn't very easy, it's never very easy, but she, she ha, she's, has an organised mind and she has a capable mind. I don't think it's a brilliant mind, but does that matter? Well, does it matter? And even if Lady Jenkin is right, is it really more about practical problem solving? On the doorstep myself, I found that the people among whom Theresa May's name really does help a Tory canvasser are precisely the kind of people she's always talking about. The middle middle classes, the lower middle classes, people who have a bit of a struggle, have to look for their next penny, but are just about managing. The people whose problems she thinks she understands better than your typical Tory politician. My hunch is that she's right. Nor should we overlook her moments of intellectual daring, too frequent to dismiss as untypical. That famous nasty party speech, for instance, her fierce expression of sympathy for black youth. If you're black, 
you're treated more harshly by the criminal justice system than if you're white. Her visible outrage at what she sees as injustice, like when she refused to extradite the hacker Gary McKinnon to the United States. Make no mistake. Or her astonishing speech laying into the police federation. If the federation does not start to turn itself around, you must not be under the impression that the government will let things remain as they are. What annoys her with other people? I think if she's not uh, treated with um, respect, that respect. tends to annoy. But, but that would annoy me, and uh, I suspect it would annoy you as well. Whether Theresa May is respected by those on the other side of the table may depend not so much on her majority, were she to get it, but her abilities. This is a big question. Does she have those negotiating skills? I think she has great control in, in, the, in the sense that if she doesn't get her way, she won't necessarily always reveal her inner fury, but she clearly won't forget it either. Um, and again, that's a strength, but it also can be a bit of a weakness if you're having to, if you're having to deploy quicksilver skills um, to cajole and charm and persuade people to do what you want. Eric Pickles made a surprising, possibly unintended claim. I always found her very straightforward to deal with, providing you told her what you, what you wanted to do and um, you didn't try to get yourself into a negotiation. Most people in uh, politics are transactional. You do this and I'll get that. She isn't like that at all. She is the worst person in the world to do a deal because she'll do things on their merit. But if you come to her in a reasonable way with a reasonable case, nine times out of ten she'll back you. Her unwillingness to horse trade was a close relative of another Theresa May tactic in meetings and negotiations. Um, what she does do, and she does it with journalists as well, is that she uses silence to enormous effect. So she doesn't always, uh, she's not always forthcoming. Now what that means is that other people will fill the gap. And that's, I think, quite a useful strategy because she gets an awful lot of information out of people. I mean, one technique that I ad admired um, uh, was she did have the ability uh, uh, which I remember sort of making a mental note that I must try and sort of emulate myself, uh, of just sort of saying no and then sitting there and saying nothing. <laughs> but I remember we sort of said, it's like, well, what's the point of having a meeting if you're, just, if you're not prepared to talk? If her silence was her strength, I wanted to know her weaknesses. While she's lost her air of invincibility in this general election campaign, I wanted to know what people who knew her thought, if she were to fall, would bring her down. I was surprised by their near unanimity. If she was, to, if she was to fail, then it might be sometimes the ability to build um, a, a coalition inside the party to support her. Perhaps it would be about not listening to uh, a wide variety of voices. That would be my instinct. Even one of her oldest friends agrees. Do you see any character traits that that might trip her? Um, possibly her lack of ability to form a gang. I don't know how that works with making her cabinet into a team, though I'm told she's quite good to work for in the, in the civil service sense, so she may be able to do that well. Um, perhaps some rigidity. Gets worse as you get older from my experience, anyway. <laughs> Who is Theresa May? Is it her early life that holds the key? Or do reflections of colleagues shed more light? I still can't say I know. She keeps her personality, her identity almost, guarded like a castle. Whether it's in the silences that act like a moat, or close advisers who act like archers firing from the walls, the urge to keep the world out needs explaining. You might behave as she does if you absolutely knew what to do and would brook no opposition. You might behave as she does if you didn't have a clue. Which is it?
I end, as I started, none the wiser. Matthew Paris on Theresa May. We've been out and about in this campaign, not quite as intended as this happens as a result of the Manchester and London attacks, but it is fair to say that every town and city has a perspective and every visit away from home provides an insight. So we've brought two members of our election uh, panel to Bolton to help us analyse the campaign. Polly McKenzie, former advisor to Nick Clegg, and writer and columnist and Corbyn supporter Paul Mason. In London is Ian Dale. We thought we'd keep him there, keep him away from Paul. Uh, Ian Dale, Tory supporting LBC presenter. Uh, good evening to you all. Look, let's talk about Theresa May because we've just had a Theresa May um, profile there. Ian, I want to start by you, because you, when the manifesto came out on this programme, said you didn't think very much for the manifesto. And I wonder what now, as you look back on this campaign, what you think went wrong with the campaign? Well, I think that film from Matthew Paris was absolutely outstanding. It, it, it told me things about Theresa May that I didn't know. I thought it was really insightful. Um, I, I think the problem with the manifesto was that it didn't compete with Labour's in terms of its vision, in terms of its eye-catching policies, uh, in terms of its layout, indeed. Uh, uh, there, there was nothing for Tory canvassers, as I think I said at the time, to go out and sell on the doorstep. And because the social care, on pol care policy unravelled within a few days, that always left them on the back foot. And people are still mentioning that even today. And to try to pretend that having a, ha not having a cap and then having a cap wasn't a U-turn was just completely unsustainable. So I think they're always on the back foot from that moment on. I think in the last week, since the question time debate, I think Theresa May has recovered her mojo somewhat and has come across in a, in a very different way to the previous couple of weeks. Polly, what do you think? I'm just, what do you think about the Theresa May campaign? What, it clearly hasn't been as, as, where they, what they wanted. No, it, it hasn't been. Um, I think when Theresa May is really good is when she is absolutely on top of her brief, when she knows every in and out of it. And actually, on on police reform, on on gender equality, she was always really forensic on that. The problem with pulling together a whole manifesto for an entire kind of uh, entirety of government in a few short weeks is that it requires a lot more nimbleness and the ability to be flexible and get to grips with things. And I think they threw some things in there at the last minute. Oh, let's just say something about fox hunting. Let's just say something about social care that looks brave. And in the end, it became a bit of a mishmash. And when she's not fully briefed, when she's not in the detail, that's when I think the mistakes mm. have been made. OK, so that's a fair point. I mean, Linton Crosby, Paul, is meant to be the world's best political campaign of the guy who knows how to run a campaign. It didn't quite work in one or two other ones, though. Look, I, I've been on the doorstep in, in some constituencies in, in the northwest this today, and um, one thing nobody talks about is Theresa May. It's really interesting. Of course, as a Labour canvasser, you get, I might not vote or I won't vote for you because of either Corbyn or a policy, or, or people's circumstances change. But there's no enthusiasm for her. And I think she, this is a strategic mistake because she, she, I know for a fact she is not patrician. You know, she is not a patrician. She's walked into studios like this where I've been reporting, you, be, you may have been presenting. She's not a patrician, but she's behaved in a patrician way. And as I said at the beginning, she won't meet, meet a single ordinary person. And I I think she really, if you, we could probably count them on, on, quite, on what, a couple of hands, how many, she hasn't exposed herself to that amazing, that amazing rocky ride that you go, that yeah. people like Corbyn go through, where you meet real people. And it, it's not been quite raucous enough. Ian, I want to ask you a really important question. This is actually, I think, the most important question, perhaps, for the country. Is Theresa May better than the campaign has given the impression of her being? Because many are saying she hasn't looked good in this campaign. Is that because she isn't good or is that because the campaign has been rather badly handled? What do you think? Well, I think she, she came into office as Prime Minister as a surprise. She wasn't expecting it to happen. It happened. And we have, what, nine months to judge her on as Prime Minister. And I think she actually did really well in those nine months as Prime Minister. She proved she could do the job. Um, she didn't come into TV studios every five minutes, which her predecessor did quite a lot. A Prime Ministerial interview became, had a sense of occasion about it. I think that's probably right. And I, I think, I mean, I'm going to take Paul up on what he just said there. To say that she hasn't met normal people doing this campaign, of course, what the TV cameras don't show you is when she goes to these factories, she takes like 20 or 30 questions from the people in the audience. And they're not always Conservative supporters. They're the people that work in the factories. Jeremy Corbyn in this campaign has been brilliant at attracting massive crowds of enthusiastic supporters, but I haven't seen many occasions when he's interacted with normal people. Um, he's done no phone-ins, for example. 
Well, she has. Interesting example. Okay, Paul, answer that point, and then I'll let Polly talk about. Well, Theresa we have May. numerous examples where those factory meetings are pre-vetted, and they should be for security reasons. But uh, let, let's leave that aside. If if the Tories want to go into tomorrow believing that in Theresa May's invincibility because Jeremy Corbyn hasn't met any real people, good. Please carry on. We'd be very happy for you to take the actions uh, contingent on that belief. Polly, I wanted to just ask you: Do you think Theresa May, because Ian thinks she's she's proved herself over nine months, and if she hasn't looked as confident in the campaign as she has as Prime Minister, probably that's just, you know, that she's not as good on her feet and at campaigning. What do you think it is, though? Do you think the campaign has, has, has been sort of unfairly... I, I, the, the problem with campaigns is they do require you to just be a bit more human yeah. and relaxed and, and, and much more flexible. And on your feet, I mean, thinking, yeah, all exactly. the, thinking very quickly. And, and that's just, I just don't think that's her natural kind of... Does that matter for a Prime Minister? Do you need to be someone who thinks on well, your feet? Or can you basically really... take a little bit of time? And it, you know, it's just one of those <laughs> skills we expect you to do when campaigning, but frankly... Well, it, and, and there were times when uh, with Donald Trump's travel ban, for example, where she, she was sort of criticised for not being able to respond quickly. And it, you know, it took her hours and hours because she needed to get a briefing from every department. I think I think that is her weakness, but on the her, on the kind of flip side of that, her strength is that she really she does take a brief well. She thinks about things before she makes decisions. She she's a better prime minister than she is campaigner. Um, but the question is whether it's kind of whether whether it's she's damaged her leadership and that invincibility. Thank you all very much. We're going to come back to you for a longer discussion uh, a little bit later. But look, every election has its exciting moments, and who could deny that in this one there's been nothing to rival Chris Cook's appearances in front of a graphic screen, where he explains where the campaign is being fought and what that tells us. And it seems only fitting that we give Chris one last outing. Can we learn something about what the parties are expecting tomorrow from where their leaders have been campaigning? It's great to be with you. If there is, the BBC Newsnight campaign tracker should help find it. So, to start, let's return to a familiar graph. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. Each dot here represents a constituency where the Tories are facing Labour. The furthest left seats are the safest Labour seats from 2015. The furthest right ones are the safest Tory seats from 2015. The most marginal ones are the ones in the middle. Looking vertically, the higher up seats are ones where UKIP got a higher vote share. Now, these rings mark out where Theresa May has held a campaign visit since the Tory manifesto launch a month ago. Now, notice how she's much more ambitious in her campaigning in areas with higher UKIP vote shares. She goes much further left in the high UKIP areas at the top of the chart than she goes in the low UKIP areas at the bottom of the chart. You can use this chart to mark out the edges of what the Tories seem to think is possible. And I suggest they imply the zone of gains is something like this. They seem to be targeting between around 30 and 50 extra seats in England and Wales. Now, Ms May has only been to Scotland a few times, but trips by Ruth Davidson, the Scottish Tory leader, imply they're going for around 10 seats up there. So it looks like the Tories are aiming for around 40 to 60 extra seats. Jeremy Corbyn's campaign, though, suggests something rather different. First, he's going to a lot of very safe Labour seats and a lot of Tory-held seats. But that zone where Theresa May's been fighting, not so much. So we can't really easily draw in a similar sort of guesstimate about where he thinks the campaign is. It might be worth joining up a few dots here. So the first thing to know is local TV news bulletins actually get bigger audiences and are more trusted than the national TV bulletins. Secondly, it's worth noting that Mr Corbyn's rallies look great on television. They're really telegenic. And finally, while Mr Corbyn isn't going directly into those Tory target seats, he is going to lots of seats that are in the same TV region as them. So that means that images of his energetic, well-attended rallies will be broadcast into the marginals on the local news. This strategy also means he meets lots of party members, as he did tonight, which, cynics note, would be a benefit if there's a leadership challenge. Labour's events are certainly quite hard to read. The Tory intention of making big gains tomorrow, though, is extremely clear. Chris Cook. Let's carry on thinking about the campaign, because one of the questions that leaps out, of, out at you as you observe how it's unfolded is how politicians should engage with the public. You might have thought we were in for an era of less controlled messaging. Hasn't Trump perhaps shown that a less buttoned up style of campaigning, he's shown that it can appeal. You might have thought that, but this election was very often 
very controlled. Perhaps security has made some of that inevitable. But has it been too much? John Sweeney looks at how things have changed. to sit down, sir, or I'm I'm not not here. Here. I have to ask you to leave. That is to say, if you are a little boy, I'm not a little girl. <laughs> the art of political theatre, of how to handle hostile heckling, used to thrive in this country. Look at these performances by the masters. Within our tightly controlled and rigidly expanded government expenditure programme for the next five years. Michael knows... We have no plans for expenditure in Vietnam. We can't go on from here now. Really? <laughs> now, I saw you at the beginning of the week. Have you been with me ever since? <laughs> what the hell are you using for transport? Helicopters? <laughs> Half a century on, things are rather different. Back in the day, Robert Harris, formerly of Newsnight, reported on how control freakery was ruining British politics. Well, this alleg these allegations um, of a prime minister, a female prime minister, avoiding all contact with uh, journalists and with the public are not new. I mean, uh, uh, terrifyingly, a third of a century ago, as a much younger man, uh, I came the wrong end of an encounter with Margaret Thatcher, who was touring the Raycol factory in Reading. This is what it's like being on the campaign trail with the Prime Minister in 19... Uh, with no voters anywhere, and the workers not really very interested. It was just to get pictures of her in a factory with new technology. What there are are hundreds of members of the media who swarm around the Prime Minister, follow her every move, and the idea from the Conservatives' point of view <laughs> is to get the best possible exposure on the TV news that evening. That really, I think, was a breakout, new kind of election. American style, copied from Reagan, uh, where you didn't do the monster rally, uh, you didn't go out on the hustings, you just got good pictures for the evening news. Back then, politics was raw and brutal. Keep calm! And much more fun. Mainly I find it very helpful to invite them to... You know, I, sorry, I couldn't hear, I'll say it again, and then you come back. Even your conservative leader described Rhodesia as a police state. You wouldn't last long there, my friend. <laughs> now then. <laughs> my friend, we do not support savages. We just allow them to come to our meetings, that's all. Here he goes, there's Neil Kinnock. Hey. By the early 90s, political control freakery was the new normal. Don't let the people who take to the streets take your country! But then underdog John Major dug out his soapbox from the attic. I caught up with him on the Tory campaign jet. Mr Major, can you do me a favour? Could you video me for my video diary for the late show? <laughs> you put your left hand through there. I think um, this is untrue. No, 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 it is. no it's working, it's working. I'll tell you what. No, it's, look, it's working. Can I really see you? I can yes, see you. You can see me. So, uh, this is a piece of camera... Would you mind putting your tie up? It Sorry. looks absolutely <laughs> lovely. Major's relative openness has all but gone. Jeremy Corbyn relishes campaigning, but it would take a brave soul to heckle here. History tells us that just because your side loves you doesn't mean you're going to win. It was very noticeable, the difference between Thatcher's campaign and Foote's campaign, which was huge rallies. And one, one evening, I think he had 30,000 people. Uh, you know, much good it did him. Just how controlled is the Theresa May campaign? So it has the flavour of an evangelical meeting. Everybody here agrees with St Theresa. But the problem is, where's the argument? Where's the challenge? Where's the politics? To be fair, reporters say she's been taking more questions in the past week. But the sage of Kintbury is not convinced. There is something wrong with this election. I think a lot of people feel it, no matter what your party is. That is that the Prime Minister in particular is not engaging with people. And that is an offence uh, to the electorate, it seems to me. 
Control may feel right for the political parties, but one cannot but wonder whether our democracy is losing out. John Sweeney on the art of campaigning with the people. OK, we're back with our panel. Ian Dale, Polly McKenzie, Paul Mason are with us. We're going to start this last section of the programme with getting their predictions for the election outcome. I'm going to ask them who they think will be the biggest party and what the size of the majority will be. Will it be a Tory majority of 10, 20, 30, 40, 50, up to 100 or more? Uh, Ian Dale... I'm going to start with you. Who do you think will be the biggest party, first of all? Uh, you might not be surprised for me to say Conservative. <laughs> OK, so I picked off the, uh, the blue rosette. OK, Ian, what, what, what are you suggesting? A majority? Have you, got of... more, have you got more than one rose out there? Because I want to have two goes. Because my, my gut feel at the beginning of this campaign was a majority <laughs> of 74. And there's part of me that still believes that. But I've done these seat-by-seat -seat predictions and I've revised them over the weekend. And it still comes out with a Conservative majority of 122. 122? Should yep. we take the average and just call it 100? I mean, that's you about right. You do what right, you like, Kevin. For you. OK, I'm going to put yours on the 100. There you go. 100. Polly, I've got, I've, I've got, I've got a, a yellow Lib Dem one for you if you want it. But if you want... The Lib Dems are not going to win this election okay, with a majority. OK, so we've established that. Fine. I'm pretty confident on that one. Your... You're going, you're going... With I'm, I, the Conservatives are going to be the biggest party. Conservative yeah. biggest I, a, party. I, I guess a bit more cautious than Ian, uh, because there's been such kind of noise about social care in particular, and when you mess around with people's houses, they, you know, I think it affects turnout. So I, I'd go 60. A, a majority of majority 60? Majority of 60. I mean, YouGov, just remember, YouGov, their model, and it's a model... Mm. They're getting a hung parliament. They're somewhere yep. here. But you're going for yeah, 60 and Ian's going for 100. Yeah. You look I'm not going to let you change. Look at the seat-by-seats seats in the YouGov uh, polling and it, model. It just doesn't make any sense. It's nonsense. Right. Now, Paul, when we... I think it was the day the election was announced we had you on in the same panel and you said you thought Labour would win. Could win. <laughs> no, I think, I think it was a bit stronger than okay, could win. Well, OK, yeah, I think um, it was a bit stronger. Me anyway, 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 what are you saying now? So I have a heart and head prediction. Um, and my, my head tells me between 20 and 30 majority for the Tories. They'll be the largest party uh, yeah. because I think Labour won't claw back. We might get three seats in, in Scotland, but the Tories' largest party. But I think hung parliament, uh, progressive alliance, bring it on. That's what okay. I think. So, so, so perfectly possible, the hung parliament, but probably something no, like... No, no, I, I, actually, I actually think my, my head says 30, but I'm going with my heart. Stick it down there. Hung Parliament, oh, Progressive Alliance. On the, on the white bit. Yeah, <laughs> progressive, progressive I'm sorry, Alliance. It's like a proper back classic. Can't be moved. It's, a, it's, like, it's like a sort of Vladimir Putin style. <laughs> right. was, someone's decided it out OK, we want, we want to just put a Corbyn one. I mean, look, well, you put you your put heart for there, the but, Hung Parliament. But it, we're not going to be anything the kind like of, the, the but biggest probably party. not the biggest yeah. party. OK, we'll put Corbyn, Corbyn, take Corbyn down there. Well, look, we'll, we'll see. But, Paul, quite seriously, at the early start, at the start of this campaign, when there were 20 point leads for the Tories, what were you thinking about yourself and the prediction that Labour could win or Labour would win? I mean, what were you... You must I was, have felt down I was pretty, No, no, I wasn't. I was pretty confident. And I thought, uh, you know, I mean, one, you're always trying to assess day by day. But I said on this programme that because of Theresa May's May the 3rd uh, speech where she basically declared verbal war on, on Juncker, and at, at that point UKIP's vote collapsed, if you remember, in the polls, I said we have to do something equally dramatic. But I knew... Uh, that we would, and I thought, you know, 9,000 a year for students, nine uh, quid a week for school dinner money, that's quite dramatic if, you, if, you, if you're on earning about uh, £8.50 an hour and, and on a zero hours contract. Okay, so the manifesto was yeah, the thing that absolutely. changed, was the game changer, I, I thought, and I, you were confident knew, that they would find it. I knew one. it would, yeah. Let me just ask you all, because I said, is, is Theresa May, you know, she's, her, her ratings have gone down, is that because she's not good or is that because her campaign is bad? Corbyn's ratings have gone up. Ian Dale, is that because Corbyn is a good campaigner or is that because Corbyn is really a good leader? Which do you think that is? I think he's run a much better campaign than I think even Paul thought he probably would, certainly better than I thought he would. He's relaxed into it and that's always a good thing for a politician to do. But I think Paul is clutching onto a few straws or opinion poll straws in his prediction because it's only YouGov and Salvation that are showing these very narrow Tory leads. Salvation had a poll yesterday showing a 1%, one point Tory lead and that was based on the premise that young voters aged 18 to 24 would have a 90% turnout. 
Now, YouGov have had similar modelling in their polls and in their, Polly was right, their constituency predictions. They've got Canterbury with a majority of 10,000 going to Labour, presumably because the whole of the University of Kent is going to come out and vote Labour. They've got Anna Subri losing her seat. If you type in virtually any constituency, it's lunacy. And these two pollsters, I would say, are going to have a huge amount of egg on their face on Friday morning. But if they don't, I will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Though actually, you guys have kind of hedged their bets, added in the don't knows, and yeah. uh, suddenly widened up their Tory lead. Yeah. In their last and I think poll. they're right too, because for us, for Labour strategists, uh, not everything depends on on the on the student youth vote turning out, but a lot does. The, the variables do, uh, and I'd also say there's another group, and that is the the the, the peop mums and dads with well, mums and mums, you know, parents with kids in primary school. That's the people I found the most energised on the doorstep. Uh, but, you know, you, 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 it only takes for what, you know, somebody falls over in the playground and you haven't got time to vote. So, it, it, turnout is a big thing for Labour. Yeah, no, it will, will be a big thing and it's pouring with rain outside <laughs> at the moment. You're in the northwest yeah. of England. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, one really interesting thing about this election is normally you say, Oh, if you're ahead on the economy and you're ahead on leader, mm. it's a, it, it, that, that's more, worth more than being ahead in the opinion polls. And we should have known that last time and Cameron was ahead on, uh, on leadership over Miliband and Tories were ahead on the economy. This election, it, I mean, it, it slightly seems to have broken that rule, doesn't it? No one's really even talked about well, the economy as far as I, I'm it, aware. We don't know because we haven't got haven't to, got you know, mm. tomorrow. And it might be that actually the fact that Theresa May is holding up on leader, she's still ahead mm. at least. Um, it, it, I think in mm, most of mm. the most of the testing, and and also she, the, the Tories are still the most trusted on the economy. So it might be that that iron rule has not been broken. Yeah. What do you think, Ian? Iron rule broken or not? I think it's really odd that the economy is the dog that hasn't barked in this campaign. Where is the Chancellor of the Exchequer? Where is he? We haven't seen him during this entire campaign. He's the scarlet pimpernel of this campaign. Now, whether that's because uh, Theresa May's keeping him locked up in a box because she's going to sack him after the election, depending on the size of her majority, who knows? But I think the electorate should hear from the Chancellor of the Exchequer during a campaign. Can you remember a single interview that he's done in this campaign? Because I'm damned if I can. No, he did one early on. He did, he did an early one on the Today programme, I seem to remember. And there but was that joint press conference they had about yeah, how well, Labour's didn't sums didn't add up, <laughs> um, where she refused to endorse him. Yeah. I just think that in terms of the, the classics, everything, all bets are off because you've had Brexit. Brexit is, is like a sort of bomb going off in the, in the, kind, of, in the kind of general sort of world of, 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 of politics that blows everything a, a, a bit apart. And then... And then and Dis disorientated in general. We haven't talked about Brexit very much. No. Right? I mean, it has. It was the Brexit election. It's barely, it's barely come up. Gone in. Well, you're absolutely right on that. And um, I've said to a lot of my Tory friends throughout this campaign, why on earth are you not getting Brexit back on the agenda? That is where you can really score a big majority in this election. Uh, they tried to do it, but the problem is that they haven't actually got anything new to say that they haven't said before. <laughs> I think they were hoping for Jean Claude Juncker to say something controversial, but um, he's actually kept remarkably silent over the last few days. I think now, but given what happened in London over the weekend, given what happened in Manchester, uh, I certainly detect that there are a lot of people thinking about security in the last couple of days. And you might think that if they did, well, they would automatically be more inclined to vote Conservative. Um, I'm not sure that's entirely happening. Certainly uh, on my radio phone-ins, I find there's a huge amount of enthusiasm among floating voters now for Jeremy Corbyn. There are some that say they'll vote Conservative because of the security issue. They, they feel safer with Theresa May. But it's not the overwhelming majority that you might expect. Yeah, it's been a really messy election. I mean, Theresa May's high point was that fight with John claude Juncker and her big statement about, you know, go away, you horrible Europeans. Uh, that took her into that great local elections result. But since then, since the manifestos, basically, and I, I don't quite endorse Paul's view of the Labour manifesto being the most brilliant thing on earth, sort of smorgasbord of, mm. of spending commitments and money and promises. And so it has. It, we've just sort of lurched about talking about this policy and that policy, and then, as Ian says, moved on to this security issue right towards the end, where police cuts yeah. just comes up again, uh, which is unfortunate because, of course, Diane Abbott messed up, up on that right uh, at the beginning. And, the and remember, quick one, Paul, very quick. So it's not the security issue. We we're under attack. We feel very bruised and very, very sad about things. And I think that mass psychology of sadness and concern is, is never going to play into 
point scoring beyond what is reasonable and acceptable. And it has made it. And, and we've got to that. Further. We're not going to go any further. It has it. made it a very exceptional campaign, but it's been exceptional in other ways. Thank you all very much indeed. Next time we meet, we'll know the result. Well, that is it uh, for this evening and for this campaign. What a campaign it's been. Now, there is no news night tomorrow. We're not missing much, just the day of the James Comey Testament in Congress and the general election. But we know that in 24 hours from now, the only thing to do will be to speculate about the accuracy of the exit poll, and you'll be in really, really good hands on that front. The next time we meet, we will know the results of this strange election. We'll have some considered post-match analysis on Friday. And remember that it is only then that the real action starts with the life of a new or refreshed administration. Have a very good night. Very good evening to you. We've got some wet weather 